Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I would like to wish everyone a very happy 4th of July. I truly hope each and every one of you had a lovely day, if of course you celebrate it. But without further ado, it's time for us to get comfortable, beware that there are no ghosts around, and let the darkness take control. Back when I was just 14 years old, I was always close to my grandmother. She also enjoys our company every time that we go see her at her house. My grandma Flora is a jolly and talkative person. She likes telling stories to start a conversation. Everyone was close to her because of her infectious personality. I would sometimes insist my parents to go and take us to Grandma Flora's house and to have dinner there instead, and she would always be happy to see us. One night, I woke up with the sound of my parents' voice. They were speaking to someone on the phone. They seemed to be in a panic, and my mother kept walking back and forth. She was obviously very stressed. Then I heard my dad telling someone to please hurry and to be there as quickly as they could. I got curious and approached my father and asked him what was going on. He looked at me with a worried face. It's your grandma Flora, son. Why? What's wrong with her? I asked. Grandma Flora had an accident just now. She slipped by her kitchen and hit her head. What? How, how is Grandma? Is she going to be okay? I was very worried. Don't worry, son. Grandma is strong, and she'll be alright. Help is on its way. My dad said that, as he hugged and comforted me. I was crying by that time, because I was worried sick since it was already late, and I didn't notice that I fell asleep, and I was on my bed. It was just that morning that I heard the full story of what had happened. My mum said that she heard the phone ring downstairs. She wanted to ignore it, but it kept ringing and ringing, so she decided to stand up and go answer it. And she had goosebumps when she heard my grandma with a weak voice. Grandma was still able to call her daughter to tell her what had happened. And was frankly saying goodbye and to take care. My mum screamed to my dad to wake up and called the ambulance to go to my grandma's house. Good thing, as soon as my dad called there was an immediate response. And she still made it to the hospital and got aided. Unfortunately, she was still too weak to get out at the hospital because she lost a lot of blood. All my grandma's sons and daughters talked to each other and took turns to look after her while she was still confined to the hospital. I would go there right after class along with my aunt and cousin. We would assist Grandma to the bathroom, for she's embarrassed if it were the nurse or someone she didn't know. We would fetch her hot water whenever she needed it, since the dispensers are across the hallway, and the room she was confined to was on the 11th floor of the hospital. One night at the hospital, I was watching TV while everyone with me was already asleep along with my grandma. I was staying up because my grandma might need something when she wakes up. I heard my cousin yawn and stretched. He noticed me wide awake and said that if I wanted to take a nap, he could watch over grandma himself. I told him that I want to, but wasn't sleepy yet, since I was just being bored watching TV. 
I told him that I would walk around outside instead, and perhaps purchase some snacks. I got up and left the room. I went straight to the elevator that was going down. No one else boarded when I did go down, and when I reached the ground floor, I saw the convenience store outside. I went inside and purchased some snacks, and I returned back to the elevator going up. The elevator stopped on the third floor, fifth floor, and many people came in. There were four of us inside, me standing by the door in front of the buttons, one going up to ninth, two to the tenth, and there was me heading for the eleventh. When we reached the ninth floor, I pressed the button to give way for the person leaving. Strangely, no one seemed to be going out. I looked at my side and saw the two people who came in were staring at me for holding the door open that long. I looked behind me and there was no one there, and I can swear that there was. There were four of us inside. I ignored it when we reached the tenth floor, and now here's the scary part. As the two came out of the tenth floor, the doors closed, and in the reflection of the door, I saw the man that had come in from another floor, who didn't leave on the ninth floor, standing right behind me, facing down. I had goosebumps rising, and I hurriedly clicked the eleventh as I felt it getting closer. I panicked and tried to open the door. The dumb part I did is that I turned around and leaned against the door and faced him. He looked at me straight in the eye with a horrifying smile. His face was as pale as flour. When the door finally opened, I stumbled down crawling backwards, and as I saw it stand just at the door still, it was giving me a horrifying smile. As the elevator doors closed, I stood up and ran to my grandma's room, gasping for air. My cousin saw me and asked me what happened, and I wasn't able to speak. A few minutes later, I told him everything though, how I was coming up on the elevator. People came on, people came off, but when there were only four of us left and on the ninth floor, I thought someone was going to get out, but they didn't. And as we rose to the tenth, waiting for the two people to leave, I noticed that there was only two people in the lift with me, not three. However, once they exited the lift, the last person appeared out of nowhere. Now lifts are very small places, so obviously I couldn't exactly miss them, and I was incredibly freaked out. He was also creeped out by my story, and decided it was time to let me go to sleep. He locked the door, and kept telling me not to worry, that he'll be guarding me until morning came. I lied down on the sofa, and we decided next morning not to tell anyone about it. When me and my cousin went out to go home, a guard asked me if I was feeling alright because he saw me terrified inside the elevator and that I was running last night. I asked him how he knew, as I didn't see anyone else there, and he pointed to a monitor on his desk and said that he saw me by the security cameras. I asked him if we could see the footage, and although he was reluctant at first, he showed us. He asked to go beside him to have a look at the monitor, and he played the tape of last night and I saw myself in the elevator, panicking, and with a desperate look to leave. But on the footage, it was very clear that no one else was with me. It would sometimes go to static, and I got confused, because I was sure of what I saw. Suddenly, just behind the monitor, I saw a group picture of the hospital staff, and I freaked out. When I spotted a guy with the exact same face, I pointed out the person and kept saying, That's him! That's who I saw! The security guy looked at him, and at me, with a raised eyebrow. And he said, Are you sure? I insisted that it was him. 
It was the exact face of the person last night in the elevator. How could I forget? It half scared me to death. He said, That wouldn't be possible, sir. Mike, our maintenance man, sadly died here a month ago. There was an ongoing repair on the elevator, on the fifth floor, when it was left open. Just with a caution tape around it. And he was accidentally pushed when he tried to stop two people from fighting. This happened when I was 13 years old, and is part of the reason I am still scared of the dark. It's also the reason that I will not go into a cellar, a crawl space, basement, or any kind of space that is dark and damp. Before I get into my experience, some history is in order. Our mom remarried a man and they decided to move my brother and I to a different state, away from all of his family. Because before my mother married Dave, he attacked our father with a knife, and our father shot him. The gun had buck shots, so it was more of a scatter gun than regular bullets. Thank God. Anyway, they found this two-story house in Virginia, close to a state park. They told us that they got an amazing deal on it, because it was situated back in the woods, away from everything and everybody. At the time, my brother Eric and I hadn't seen it, because we were living at our grandmother's house and going to school, until they could get everything moved in and lined out enough for us in order to switch schools. Now I didn't want to go because I didn't like the man our mother had married, but being a kid, she wasn't about to listen to me. The day came when we had to go, and I absolutely threw a fit, because like I said, I didn't like this man. We travelled three hours to our new home, and when we get there, my brothers and I finally see this so-called amazing house. It was indeed two stories, the basement being the bottom floor and the house on top. When our mother said it was away from everything and everyone, we had no idea what she meant. It was so remote. So remote in fact that we would be living in the boondocks. This house was five miles away from the main road, surrounded by dark forest. The house layout was like this, and it's important to remember. The basement and the whole bottom floor were huge. It had one entrance with a little window all the way around it. You had to go up these huge wooden steps to a wraparound porch. Straight in front of you, Going up the steps were two huge white French doors, and those were the main front doors. When you went in the front door, you would enter the dining room. Now, you could either go straight into the kitchen, down a step, or to the hallway, which leads to the only bathroom, the basement door and the back door. Or you could go right down to the living room, which was our mother and Dave's room, and they were on the other side. You could go through an archway, and my room was on the left, and Eric's room was on the right. Now this house having a wraparound porch, all of our windows were at least at high level when standing at any point on it. My brother and I had rooms towards the back of the house, and when we looked out our windows, you could see nothing but dense forest. My first experience living there happened about a month after we moved in. Everyone was in bed, but I was still awake. I was playing video games and listening to music. I had a heavy blind over my window and curtain. Some time after 1am, I started to get sleepy. So I turned everything off and laid down to go to sleep. It was quiet, except for some crickets chirping. 
I was dozing off when I heard something. I opened my eyes thinking maybe I had dreamt it when I heard it again. It sounded like thuds. It sounded like boots on the back porch walking back and forth. I couldn't believe it. My heart was beating like a drum and I was terrified. I couldn't move, I was so scared. Then the foot fuds stopped. They stopped right in front of my window. A minute passed. Then I heard something, or someone, whisper to me, Christina. It sounded like a man, but at the same time, it didn't. It's hard to explain. It sounded unnatural. At this point, I was shaking, and had thrown my covers to the side. I had my door open, and I could see Eric asleep in his bed. Then, whatever it was, started tapping at my window, and I ran to my mom and Dave's room, banging on the door, screaming for them to get up. My mother and Dave came out of their room, with sleep-filled eyes, asking me, what was wrong? I still have no idea what I said, but it was something to the effect of somebody was trying to get into my window. Dave grabbed his flashlight and went to the back door. I stayed with my mum. He was gone for a while, and when he came back, he said that there wasn't anyone or anything that he could see outside, and didn't see any prints anywhere. I was beyond freaked out, and sleep didn't come to me that night. The next thing that happened didn't happen to me, but my brother. He was seven at the time, and my mom was big on him sleeping all alone in his room at night. I, however, would always leave my door open, in order to make him feel a little better. One night, we went to bed as usual. He said he was laying in bed, nearly asleep, when he heard something at his window. Now this was around August, and it was hot. The house had no air conditioning, so his windows had a screen over it, and he would raise it slightly to let some air flow in. Anyway, he heard something at his window, and he rised up to see what he thought was an animal. But when he looks to see it, he saw a man's face, but with yellow, glowing eyes. He screams bloody murder, and runs from the room again, banging on our mum and Dave's door. Dave grabs his light, and goes again in search of whatever or whoever was at the window. He comes back like last time, with nothing. After that night, my brother refused to sleep in that room, and began sleeping with me. A month or two go by, and one day, Eric and I come home to an empty house. Our mum and Dave had gone someplace, and would be back a lot later than they thought. I used my key, and let us in. My brother goes into the living room, and plants himself in front of the TV. I take my stuff to my room, and notice my mum hadn't gotten my laundry done. So I get the idea of doing it myself, in order to help her out. I get my brother's laundry, and head to the basement. Now when you open the basement door, you had to switch on a light to go down these wooden steps with no rails. When I opened the door, I switched on the light but nothing happened. Great, I think to myself. I can see a little because of the sunlight coming through the windows. I make my way down these steps carefully and switch on the light at the bottom of the stairs. To my relief it works and showers the dark basement in light. I make my way over to the washer and dryer and get started on the heap of laundry. I'm working, not paying attention, when the smell hits me. It smells like rotting meat and smoke. 
it turned my stomach. I start looking for the source of the smell, and when I look in the back far corner, I see something. Thinking that maybe an animal fell down the old coal chute and ran into the house that Dave hadn't blocked off yet, I went closer. That was a huge mistake. I saw a child no more than three, burnt from head to toe, reaching out its arms. I was so shocked that I fell backwards. This child started to crawl towards me and grabbed my pant leg. I kicked and screamed and closed my eyes, thinking, this is it. This is how I am going to die. Then my brother called out from down the stairs. Hey, Chris, you okay? I opened my eyes, and there was nothing there, except for a small handprint on the bottom of my jeans. I didn't think twice. I go up and ran up the stairs, dragging my brother with me. I slammed and proceeded to lock the basement door. When our mum and Dave got home, I told them about the events that had transpired, but they, of course, didn't believe me. They thought that my brother and I were making things up, or acting out, because of how we protested moving here in the first place. I couldn't believe it. Our own mother didn't believe us. I was shocked and upset, and after that, I refused to go into their basement, or let Eric go down there. Then one day, we came home from school, and our mum told us that she had something happen to her. She was cleaning as usual, and heard a child's laughter. She thought it was us, and got upset, because she thought we had skipped school. She comes out of her bedroom, and goes into the kitchen, to see a little girl in a blue dress, her arm raised, pointing a finger at her. He's coming for you, she whispered, and then vanished. She was so scared, she ran from the house to the barn, and stayed there until Dave got home. She apologised to us, saying she was sorry for not believing us. Not long after that, Mum and Dave divorced, and we left that house for good. Dave tried many times to sell the place, but couldn't because of the history. Apparently, a family living in the house sometime in the late 70s had trouble, and the father went crazy. He shot the mother and one of his two daughters, and the other one went to the basement to hide the wood when the he wood set the kitchen on fire. The little girl tried to get out, but the doors were locked, and before she could break the window, the smoke got to her, and she passed out. She died in the fire. The father, after setting the fire, turned the gun on himself, and then did his own life. Dave lived in that house until he died a few years later, and passed the house down to one of his sons. Since they couldn't sell it, it still remains in the family. I know I will never go back. And if some naive person happens to buy it, I only hope that they do not go through what we did. I was a freshman in high school, at the age of 14. Also, my father's side of the family and I recently moved into a new house in a semi-nicer area of Whittier. This was late at night in my bedroom. I shared my room with my two younger sisters, whenever they came to visit my dad. On this day, my younger sisters were at my mother's house for the weekend, since my parents had a 50-50 split with them. We had bunk beds that my sisters slept on, and I slept on the floor. Sadly, I still slept on the floor on this particular day, because I fell asleep crying, because my father and I got into a fight. I woke up around midnight with a strange feeling, as if I was being 
watched. It wasn't the first time I felt this way. This room had a wall that was basically all windows, that was shared with the den and back room. So at times, I felt this way. But for some reason, I knew for a fact that it was different. Someone was watching me. I grabbed my cell phone from my pocket, a Blackberry from the early days when phones just got flash available. I didn't want to move so much, so I slowly took pictures all around me and underneath the bunk beds. I took eight pictures to be exact. Three of them were around me, and the rest were underneath the bed. At first I reviewed the pictures from beneath the bed. The first one was normal. Emptiness with a shirt or two. The second one was a bit weird. It showed a black shadow in the corner, with green highlighting it. I thought it could have been my hand or something, and went back to the next one. And this one had a black mass covering most of the camera. I knew it couldn't have been my finger, because there were some spots that were translucent. The third was the most confusing one. It had a dark green translucent mass that literally made everything in the picture look green too. And the last picture was normal, with nothing else interesting. I knew it wasn't an effect on my phone. And I was baffled, and told myself that I would look at the other three pictures tomorrow, or I wouldn't be able to sleep again. The next day, I went back onto my phone to look at the other three pictures from the night before. As I reviewed them, only one of them stood out to me. It was a picture of the bookshelves in the TV area that was behind me. This picture had a white, kind of misty type look to it, which made me want to zoom in and look deeper. I used to watch Paranormal State and Ghost Hunters on TV so I thought it would just be a good idea. And there, on top of the TV, there was an apparition. It looked like a girl. She had long hair that covered most of her face and went all the way to her waist. And she looked like she was wearing a dress that stopped where my TV began. I was in shock that I actually caught a picture of a ghost. I showed it to my friends and my family. I felt so proud of myself, like a real ghost hunter without even trying. Until the next events happened to me, and left me in confusion still. I was kind of scared to be in my room for the next few days, since I had to sleep in that room alone. I wish I could say, I could have slept somewhere else in the house, but my father wasn't too nice and would get mad whenever I tried to sleep anywhere but my own room. I didn't want to tell him the truth why I didn't want to be there, because he never liked talking about anything paranormal or spiritual. So I was forced to sleep in that accursed room, scared that one day that girl will come again. It was quiet in my house, well, quiet in a paranormal sense, for a few weeks anyway. I eventually forgot about the pictures I took that night, and the fear that possessed me washed away. I was in my father and stepmother's room, watching Paranormal State, while they were in the front room watching a movie with my uncle and baby brother. It was an intense episode too. So my eyes were glued to the screen, until a commercial came on. So I went to grab my phone, and noticed that I'd left it in my room down the hall. I'm going to try to explain to you how the route looks. If you walk out of my father's room, on the left side is the living room, and on the right is the hallway closet. As you walk down the hall, and you get to the end, the left side would be my room, forward would be my older sister's room, and on the right is the bathroom. So I went down the hall, went into my room and got my phone. As I grab it, 
I turned the screen on to see if I have any messages. There was nothing. So I start walking back to my father's room. And as I get into the hallway, I see a figure of a girl right in front of the hall closet door. I assumed it was my younger sister. It was around her height of four foot eight inches. So I walked past the figure and tried to put my hand on her head to be the mean brother I am and push her out of my way. My hand fell through the figure like it was never there. I was scared shitless and turned to see nothing. My father saw me standing there just frozen in place and said to me, is something wrong? I shook my head and asked him, is Isabel here? No, they're still at your mum's. So I walked into his room again and resumed watching TV, shaken and breathless. I kept looking into the hallway to make sure no one was there. I eventually told my older sister that I believed that something was inside the house because she used to watch paranormal shows and stuff with me. And she started to tell me of an incident that happened to her a month before. She said that one day she came home from work and just fell asleep on her bed. After a while, she started to hear crying and someone calling her name. She thought it was our younger sister and wanted to ask her what was wrong. So she did. But the crying just continued and my sister got annoyed, got up and was about to yell at her when she noticed that there was no one else in the room with her. So she walks out to see where my sister is. But when she looks around, nobody was there. Nobody was even at the house at the time. She said she got so scared that she left to her boyfriend's house and waited until my father got home. When she told me this story, I got chills. I told her what I saw and showed her the pictures I took. It goes without saying we both believed that there was a ghost child in our house. No word, no word, I am a six foot two guy and am fairly built. I was also a Marine who saw combat for years in Fallujah a lovely little lawless town in the Al Anbar province of Iraq. I actually had some freaky things happen there as well, but that is for another time. I was dating a girl in high school, my first real love. She had a house in a part of my town, which was first established in 1688 making it a very historic place that was even once part of the Underground Railroad. It's one of the oldest houses in my town, actually. Being that we were young and thought we were going to be with each other for the rest of our lives, we spent a ton of time together. Most of it being spent at her house, since her parents were way more cool with us being holed up in a bedroom doing what young kids in love love to do for hours on end, and then passing out in each other's arms until I had to run home so fast in order not to miss curfew. Eventually, I was old enough that my parents would allow me to spend the night there under the guise that I was staying in the couch or in their spare room, which used to be her sister's bedroom until she moved out to go to college. Now the house wasn't anything special, or even super creepy. It was a pretty plain house, all things considered. It had a basement, and two stories above that, it had an attic, that was rarely ever explored. The basement was a little creepy when alone, and it had only a single incandescent light in the centre of it, to light the entire room. There was a time I had agreed to paint the walls with dry lock waterproof paint, and I had to call a friend to come over and help me, 
because I kept hearing a faint knocking noise coming to what I found out later was a bricked over little room in the center of the basement that I always joked held some kind of giant cartoonish chest of treasure from a long forgotten time. I think I only did that to ease my mind of the odd occurrences down there. In reality, it was probably a room that used to hide runaway slaves looking for safe passage along the Underground Railroad. Most of the really odd things that happened no took way. place on the first and second floor of the house though. It started out small, as it always does. Their dog was a small terrier that would routinely sit and bark at the top of the bookcases or at the corner of a room. It would stand with its hackles raised and growl at the basement door. But the place it hated the most were the stairs to the attic. It would bark for what seemed like hours at the bottom of the steps there. This became routine, and I soon ignored it. It went on like that for years, and it almost became background noise to our late night activities. I even made a joke about how it would help drown the noise that we made. What really freaked me out though, the thing that made me stop spending the night there, was what happened late one night in the winter. We had just finished one of our evening sessions, and she was downstairs making us a snack and getting some drinks. I know, what a girl, right? I was laying in bed in a sort of sleepy, satisfied daze when I heard what sounded like someone pacing around the attic, rustling through the boxes I perked up a bit and sat up in bed. Now it was a little odd, as her dad was a night owl and was usually doing his thing out, and her mother suffered from MS and was nearly bedridden. She was definitely not wandering around the dark attic, so I brushed it off and laid back down. The noises stopped eventually, and she came up with food and drink and I forgot about it almost entirely. God, I loved that girl. A few nights later, we were laying in bed together, and I heard the noises again. I asked her if her father was wandering up there, maybe looking for something from his past to regale us with, a story perhaps, as if he'd also been up there a few nights ago. She sat up and looked at me with a deadpan expression and said, there shouldn't be anyone up there. When I asked her why she looked sick, she told me with a tremble in her voice, I mean, it's impossible for anyone to walk around up there. One night, when I was young, my dad and uncle got drunk and tore all of the floorboards to burn as firewood. In the morning, I went up and looked and she was telling the truth. No boxes, no floorboards, nothing. And I never spent the night no there wood, again. No wood, Growing up, I would live with my mother during the school year and live with my dad during the summer months. I would say when I was about maybe five or seven, when my dad ended up meeting my now stepmother, and they ended up living together at my stepmother's place. The house that she lived on had been owned in their family for 196 years at the time. It's an old house out in rural America. All I knew was that it was old as shit. The earliest memories I can recall from the first summer I ended up staying there, I just had this eerie feeling over me constantly, and especially during the evening, a sort of decaying feeling. The only way I could imagine describing the feeling 
is that of someone being told after 20 years of what they felt was a happy marriage. Suddenly, out of nowhere, their spouse is pleading divorce, and it's final. Their sadness, hurt, anger, and other emotions that would follow is what I felt in that house. Except it wasn't a separation of marriage that caused it, but of death. Something, or someone, had died in that house long ago, and refused to move on. Regardless if time and other factors would move on without it. That is how it felt to me. Anyway, fast forward a few years later. My stepmom becomes pregnant with my second sister and my dad's first daughter. So in preparation, they ended up having an addition put into their house so they can have their own place and my future baby sister could have her own place. Meanwhile, my stepbrother and I shared a room. I didn't live there all year round, so it made sense. And that is when everything started. I just remember when we came back to live in the house, after the addition was put in. It was immediately exciting to see the big changes that had been done to the house, and see how they were going to set up the room for my future baby sister, and all that jazz. The first night back there, I honestly think, changed me. Before then, I used to be a heavy sleeper, to the point that I would snore and wake everyone else up around me. Today, I am a light sleeper. It's disgusting. I just remember waking up one night, an instant fear set over me. Just to give some brief background info on me at the time, I was probably five foot something, and weighing hardly 170 pounds. But I was a fatty growing up. And I had the confidence that age that made me feel like I was strong and to be reckoned with. That was the first time that I felt so scared and defenseless, I didn't know what to do. Like something was just there, looming over me in the dark, watching me, wanting to make me feel unwanted there. Over a period of weeks, this feeling would come and go every other night, and was so bothering some nights that I eventually would sprint and end up sleeping on the floor of my dad and stepmom's room. They hated that. Well, sure enough, a month later, I overheard my dad and stepmom talking, and come to find out my dad has also been having sleeping issues as well. He was telling her that some nights, he would just have this feeling come over him. It was almost as if every night, Someone was standing right on the middle of his torso. It was a cold feeling, and would not leave him alone. Made sense why he suddenly started to forget, to turn the TV off at night, to give some sort of distraction from what he knew, and what I knew our minds would turn to, when we would lay down at night. To top it off, my stepbrother at the time began to have an imaginary friend that would play toys with him. My stepmom decided to ask my stepbrother one day about his special friend and wanted to know about him. I guess he was an old black man and knew my stepmom somehow. My stepmom and all of them are black, and my dad is the opposite side of the color spectrum. After trying to figure out who it could possibly be, my stepmom said if it could have been an actual person, from the description and other random details given, it could have been her mum's grandfather. I think the most eerie feeling about his friend had to be that he had one particular toy he loved to play with, and conveniently enough, 
it was some electric toy that had like a person or a creature in a box. And when you pressed a button, it would rumble and make noises saying, let me out, help. There were occasions where we all witnessed the toy going off when the batteries were out. I think the climax of this for me was one night where I remember hearing a toy go off in my sister's room and the feeling in my gut, God help me. I thought it was so unique that one, only I had woken up and heard it, and two, everyone was dead asleep. I figured I would ignore it and that it would eventually stop and I could go back to sleeping well. I didn't. If I could have guessed the time of which this was going off, it would have been at least some 20 odd minutes of non-stop going off. I would quietly yell to my brother from across the room to see if he would wake up. So, with everything I had left in me, I got up and quickly ran into her room and started throwing each toy out of the toy chest one after another until I got to the bottom and saw the toy that was making all the racket. When I grabbed it and tried to find the switch to turn it off, it did that thing that would happen in some sort of cliche ghost movie. It turned off. I noped so fast out of that room and into my bed and under the covers. I was a mess. Maybe 10 minutes after that, my baby sister lets out a blood curdling scream that is something I would imagine a person that would make if they were having their limbs cut off against their will. Luckily, that woke my parents up, and they ran and got in there. After this happening three to five nights in a row, they decided to sleep in her in her room. To my saving grace, the summer was finally over, and I had to go back to live with my mother for the school year. I guess while I was living with my mother, some more things happened, to the point my stepmom ended up asking my stepbrother to tell his friend to go away, and that he wasn't welcome here anymore. That apparently pissed him off, but ended up agreeing and leaving. Since then, I don't think I felt anything with that house anymore. Ever since that summer though, I've never been able to fully get over that. I'm such a light sleeper now. And other than my mother's mum dealing with spiritual things and mysticism in her youth, I can't think of any reason why that stuff happened to me or my dad. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. To those of you who asked in yesterday's comments section where yesterday's intro went, I'm very sorry about that. I myself am a bit unsure what happened there. I did of course record an intro, but when I came to editing, it was gone. Now there are a few tricks you can do in Premiere Pro to try and find files when they go missing, but it was just gone. So Pandora was already in bed and I couldn't re-record it. But nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed it and the darkness did manage to take control. Speaking of enjoyment, if you enjoyed tonight's video, it would mean the world to me if you could drop a like and leave a comment. Those two eensy beensy things do an awful lot for my channel and really help me out. Thanks guys. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button as well as the bell icon to be notified every time I post. I have a pretty regular schedule posting every night at the same time in order for you not to forget and not miss out. If that there is a story that you would like to share, please remember that all you need to do is drop it in my Reddit or email it to me. In fact, most of these stories were submissions from you guys. So special thank you to all you amazing subscribers who submit your stories, especially the ones in tonight's video. I personally found them quite terrifying as paranormal stories are some of my favorites. But anyway, for now guys, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.